Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 2. Today I want to tell you about some of the fastest chemical reactions that happen in living cells. Some of these reactions, like the ones involved in photosynthesis and the regulation of your body's physiology, are faster than you might expect. An important question is, why do these reactions have such a high rate? In this video, we'll talk about a couple of ways we can make reactions faster. As we mentioned in the previous video, one way we can make a reaction faster is by changing the temperature. In that video, we saw this equation, called the Arrhenius equation. You might remember that k, the rate law constant, tells us how fast the reaction is. The higher k is, the faster the reaction. Notice that k depends on t, the temperature, so we can calculate how k changes when we change the temperature. Unfortunately, in order to use this equation, we must know the value of A, which is called the frequency factor. Every chemical reaction has a different value for A, and these can be very difficult to measure. It would be great to have an equation that allows us to calculate K at different temperatures without having to know A. Luckily, we can do that if we're clever with our math. Here's how. Suppose we perform a reaction twice, at two different temperatures. At temperature 1, we have this equation, and at temperature 2, we have this one. The activation energy is the same no matter what the temperature is, so Ea is the same both times, and so is A. But we do have two different rate constants. Remember, what we want to do is come up with an equation without A in it. We can do that by dividing these two equations. Imagine what we'll get if we divide the first equation by the second one. On the left side, we get k1 divided by k2. On the right side, we get this. It looks kind of confusing right now, but we'll make it simpler in just a second. First of all, notice that the two a's will cancel out. That was our main goal, so we've already achieved that. But still, let's simplify what's on the right side of this equation before we decide we're done. First, you might know that when we have a fraction where each side of the fraction has the same number raised to a different exponent, we can simplify it by subtracting the two exponents and having the number raised to that. So, in other words, we'll have e raised to the upper exponent minus the lower exponent. All the minus signs here on the right are a little confusing, so let's rearrange that exponent just a little. Now, this equation is correct, but it's still kind of clunky. It would be simpler if we could get rid of the exponent. From the past couple of videos, you might remember that when we have the number e raised to an exponent, we can get rid of the e if we take the natural logarithm of both sides of the equation. If we do that, we get the natural log of k1 over k2 on the left side. On the right side, we get rid of the e, so we just have what used to be the exponent. Finally, we can make the right side a little simpler if we factor out Ea over r from each term. That leaves us with this equation, and this one is really useful. Notice what it's telling us. It shows us that if we know the rate constant at one temperature, we can figure out the new rate constant if we change the temperature. In other words, we can find out how the rate of a reaction changes when we change the temperature. That's really helpful. And we can do it without having to know A, which is what was making it hard for us to use the Arrhenius equation. Let's try an example. Suppose we perform a reaction at 25.0 degrees C, and it has a rate constant of 1.00 times 10 to the minus 2 seconds to the minus 1. Then we perform it again at 70.0 degrees C and find out that it's faster, and now it has a rate constant of 3.00 times 10 to the minus 2 seconds to the minus 1. What's the activation energy of this reaction? We'll use this equation. We're solving for Ea, and we have all the rest of the data that we need. Remember, we need the temperature to be in Kelvin in order for the units to cancel out. So, here are k1 and k2, and here are t1 and t2. Notice that t1 comes second in the parentheses. When we solve the left side of the equal sign, we get negative 1.10. 
Next, we solve the term in parentheses, and we get negative 4.40 times 10 to the minus 4 kelvins to the minus 1. Now we can solve the problem, and we get an activation energy of 20,800 joules per mole. So that's the activation energy for this reaction. You probably had to solve a problem like that if you took the General Chemistry 2 lab course. One thing to remember is that once we calculate the activation energy for a reaction, it's always the same for that reaction, and we can use it in future calculations. For example, suppose we perform the same reaction again, but this time at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. What will be the new rate constant? We'll use this equation again. We want to know the new rate constant, so K2 is the unknown. In the previous problem, we found that Ea is 20,800 joules per mole. T2 is 100 degrees C, which is 373.15 K. We had two temperatures and rate constants in the previous problem. We can choose either of those temperatures for T1 in this problem. Let's use 25.0 degrees C and the rate constant that went with it, which was 1.00 times 10 to the minus 2 seconds to the minus 1. Now we'll just solve for K2. The term in parentheses is negative 6.74 times 10 to the minus 4 Kelvin to the minus 1. Now the right side of the equal sign turns out to be negative 1.69. We need to get rid of the logarithm on the left side, and we do that by making the right side of the equal sign the exponent on e. That gives us 0 0.185 on the right side. Finally, we get 5.41 times 10 to the minus 2 seconds to the minus 1 for the rate constant. Notice that in the past couple of problems, we've used three different temperatures, and we got three different rate constants. As you can see, the rate constant got higher every time the temperature went up. That means the reaction gets faster at higher temperatures, which is what we might expect. So, one way we can make a reaction faster is by raising the temperature. However, some reactions are very slow, even at high temperatures. The reason is that the activation energy for those reactions is very high, so very few of the reactant molecules have enough energy to get over the activation energy barrier. For example, consider this reaction. Carbon dioxide and water can react to form glucose and oxygen. You might recognize this as the reaction that takes place during photosynthesis, in which plants convert CO2 into oxygen. This reaction has an incredibly high activation energy of 15,144,000 joules per mole. As a result, this reaction is so slow, it's essentially impossible even at high temperatures. You kind of know this already. If you were to bubble CO2 into a beaker of water, you wouldn't expect to see them react to form oxygen and glucose. But we all know that this reaction does happen during photosynthesis. What makes this very slow reaction happen at a reasonable rate? The secret is that many chemical reactions can be made faster using what's called a catalyst. A catalyst is a chemical that can reduce the activation energy of a reaction. So, for example, here's a typical reaction without a catalyst. If we add a catalyst to it, the activation energy decreases, so it might look like this. That means that the reactants will no longer need as much energy to get over the barrier, and that will make the reaction faster. An important feature of a catalyst is that they're not actually used up in the reaction, so they're still there after the reaction is over. Lots of chemical reactions that take place in living things have very high activation energies, like photosynthesis, so they'd be almost impossible without catalysts to help them along. In living things, many of the catalysts are a type of protein called an enzyme. For example, one chemical reaction that's very important is this one. In this reaction, CO2 and water combine to form carbonic acid. This is a reaction that happens in your blood in order to keep the pH of your blood at the exact level it should be. The reaction is essential for human health, but it has a fairly high activation energy of 85,600 joules per mole. 
That means this reaction is fairly slow at body temperature. But the reaction is much faster because of an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Here's a picture of carbonic anhydrase. Like most proteins, it's a very large molecule. If we look at a less detailed sketch of it, it looks like this. The enzyme is a long chain, which is what this multicolored ribbon is. But on the surface of the enzyme is a zinc atom, and it's this zinc atom that helps the enzyme make the reaction faster. The zinc helps the two reactants, carbon dioxide and water, get close to each other at just the right angle to make the reaction easier, and that makes the activation energy much lower than it would be without the enzyme. Well, that's enough new material for today. We've talked a lot about chemical reaction rates in the last several videos, so next time we'll start a whole new topic. I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, have a good week.